What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Cage My IQ. I'm your host, Cage. Joining with me, as always, is my co-host, Jim. How's it going, Jim? It's going good, man. How are you? I am doing good. I am ready to preview UFC 278, which is headlined by Kamaru Usman versus Leon Edwards 2. This is the oh. rematch from, I believe, four or five years ago. When they first fought, this is act, the first fight is actually the last time Leon Edwards has lost. He's riding yep. a 10 fight winning streak, whereas Usman is riding a 15 fight winning streak. He's uh, undefeated in the UFC. Uh, what was your thoughts on this card when, when it was first announced? And then let me add uh, this straight this is the first time that they're coming back to Salt Lake City, Utah since 2006. Yeah, you know, the announcement of the card, obviously the headliner is huge. You know, this is, like you had said, the last fight Leon lost. Both have been going through a tear. We'll talk about that. The rest of the supporting card's really good. We get Luke Rockhold returning. Paulo Costa's fighting. Um, You know, we've got a lot of fighters that some people may or may not know. But the thing that really, like, stuck out to me is... Salt Lake City doesn't seem like a huge UFC, you know, like staple for pay-per-views. I would have thought Texas, but I know they just did Texas or like, you know, somewhere other than Salt Lake City. But I'm glad that they're branching out. It gives me more hope that they're eventually going to come to Philadelphia or Atlantic City or somewhere near you and I. So we can finally see these guys fight live. Uh, But overall, I love this card. Uh, Yeah, definitely so. But, of course, this is Cage My IQ, uh, the best place for MMA content. You can follow and subscribe to us on social media at Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube. As you see right now, of course, we're on YouTube right now. If you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button and notification bell so that you never miss any of the new content that we put out for you. And please smash the like button down below. And hit us up in the comment section to the right uh, with any of your opinions on this pay-per-view. Who who are your upset picks? Who do you think is going to win? And then your thoughts on our predictions for UFC 278. And then, of course, we have a cash app now. If you feel like you want to donate to the podcast, the cash app is uh, dial sign Daniel Bickley. If you wish to support the show, you do not have to. But if you want to, it's really appreciated. So once again, it's dollar sign Daniel Bakley. But uh, let's get going to the prediction side of things. We have a 13-fight MMA bout this Saturday night, uh, live from the Vivint Arena Center in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Let's start with the first fight on the prelims. we got a men's flyweight matchup between Victor Altamirano, Going up against Daniel Da Silva, we got El Magnifico versus uh, Mojo versus Miojo. Uh, Jim, what's your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? It's a strong, uh, strong fight to start the card. Um, I have Victor Altamirano winning this one. Uh, he's more accurate on his feet. He does more with his takedowns, whereas Daniel yeah. Da Silva keeps his head on a straight line and has absorbed a lot of significant shots in his two UFC fights. Um, Alta Murano has been a higher volume decision fighter as of late, and I think that's going to continue. Um, the Silva's got a pretty good chin. He's good on the ground as well. So I see Victor uh, Alta Murano winning by decision. And this is a nice contrast of styles. First, you got Victor. He has that Taekwondo background. He has a little bit of bo- a boxing experience. He, he is trained in BJJ. He likes to fight from a distance. Uh, a lot of his fights go to decision. He likes to just rack up the volume, move, and uh, be a moving uh, uh, target. Whereas Daniel De Silva, he's a big time striker. He has a good BJJ background. A lot of his fights end in decision, whether, whether it's by submission or knockout. And he likes to dictate the pace. And just like I said, o- almost all of his fights end in, uh, in with a finish. So it's all going to depend on if Dana De Silva can connect and get close enough to Victor Altamirano yeah. to land those big shots or take him down, or is Victor going to 
wind up just pick and move, pick and move, and win by uh, win by points via volume. I'm going to go with Victor Altamirano in this one because I feel like his cardio is going to be a big play here. I think he's just going to hit, move, hit, move, avoid those big shots. And as long as he can avoid getting knocked out or submitted, he should be able to win by decision. So I'm going with Victor by decision. Yeah, there's a lot of fights on this card that can really be determined on pacing. I found, mm-hmm. like, I have a lot of these fights going to decision, spoiler alert, but there's a lot of them where I was like, man, you know, there's a lot of heavy favorites, but one shot and you're done. Like, it's just, th- this one was a, this was a tough one in terms of just watching fight tape and breaking it all down. Yeah, definitely so. But let's transition over to the second fight that we have on the prelims. We got a men's bantamweight matchup between Aori Lang going up against Jay Perrin. We got the Mongolian Mortar going up against the Joker. Uh, Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? Yeah, I have uh, Aori Lang winning this fight. Um, he moves forward and takes punches to land punches at a high volume, um, where both of these fighters also like to shoot for takedowns and also get taken down a few times per fight. That's something to look at. I going over the past few fights. Um, Aroki Lang is either going to knock you out or rock, rack up enough volume to get the fight to the decision, where Perrin is more dangerous on the ground and could capitalize on those takedowns, given that both of these guys are susceptible to the takedowns. Um, but I feel like he's going to get outstruck in, uh, in this fight. He has a very solid chin. Jay Perrin does. He's never been knocked out in, in his career. So I don't see him getting knocked out, but I do see him losing by decision. I have a rookie Lang winning by decision. Yeah, I, I was looking into this fight. I, I had to remember that Jay Perrin took the fight against Batista on a week notice. Uh, mm-hmm. So he looked very good for what I saw, even though he got beat. He has a great chin, like you said, and he's a tough guy. He has a boxing and boxing in a BJJ background, and then he also has wrestling. He wrestled in, in uh, high school, I believe. Uh, but he has good hands, good movement, a very tough chin, like we said. He usually uses his uh, striking combinations to set up his wrestling, uh, so he can take the fight down to the ground, use transitions, and ground and pound. His disguises are one of his best weapons. He disguises those takedowns very well. And he, he loves to go for the back of his opponents. And then you got Rory Lang. He's primarily a striker. He's one of those guys that reminds you of like a street a street fighter with his striking. He has a grappling background. He likes to stand up and battle with his opponent, knockout power. And he only uses his uh, wrestling when he's getting hit with, the, with strikes and he needs to change a pace. So he uses the wrestling as a secondary option to take the fight to the ground and ground and pound. I could see this one going either way because of uh, the contrast in styles. Aori Lang tends to make a lot of mistakes in fights where he, when he should be taking the fight to the ground or clinching up, he just stands there and bangs with his opponent. And that's something that he shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be doing in a lot of these fights. That's why he's, he's lost a couple of fights that he has, has has had. But I'm going to go with him by decision, just like you. I would think that he would be able to knock out Jay Perrin. But I think Jay Perrin has a good enough chin to where he can last the fight. I think it's going to be a really good f- a fight that's going to go back and forth. But I think Avery Lang is going to win uh, two rounds to one decision. I think he gives up the third round because he gets tired, and then Jay Perrin steals the last round, has a chance to win, but doesn't do enough. So I'm going with Aori Lang by decision. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that kind of stands out with a lot of these fights that we're going to break down moving forward is uh, the differencing in styles and whether or not the judges in Utah are going to value the takedown more than control, you know, uh, octagon control time. Um, it, if Jay lands six takedowns, but he loses all the striking, you know, he could win this fight by split. So there's, it all depends on, you know, the scoring of, of the judges, which has been a, a problem for, for years. And is something that's been really inconsistent. Yeah, definitely. So, especially the, 
the what is a 10 8 to a 10 9 because a lot, there's a lot of differences in how they score and there's no consistency there. So I definitely agree with you with that. But uh, let's move on to the third fight on the prelims. We got a men's flyweight matchup between Amir El Basi going up against Francisco Figueredo. We got the Prince going up against the Sniper. Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And who do you have winning? I like this matchup. Um, I have Amir Albazi winning this one. Um, I feel he's more well-rounded, whereas Francisco Figueredo focuses more on his grappling. Um, I looked at a few of their fights, but paid closer attention to their fights with Malcolm Gordon, who's their common opponent um, as of late. Um, and Albazi handled that fight with ease yeah. and subbed him, where Figueredo lost by decision. Um, Figueredo's gas tank has been an issue. We've talked about it in previous uh, breakdowns. And I see him wearing down because Albazi continues to move forward. He's got really good cardio. Um, and I see Vic, uh, Amir Albazi getting a second round submission over Francisco Figueredo. Yeah, these two guys are like, they have similar traits, but to me, they're two different uh, style fighters. Yeah. First, you got uh, Figueredo. He, he has pretty good uh, striking, but he's all about the, the grappling and the submission game. Of course, you know, his brothers, Davis and Figueredo, who has knockout power, but really good uh, grappling on the ground, transitions into submissions. He has less of the knockout power and more of the uh, grappling transitions and submission game. But then, just like you said, he has cardio issues. He tends to start out fast, but then he uh, starts to fade later and later in this fight. He did get that quick uh, submission victory last fight, I believe it was against uh, De Silva, where yeah. he just slipped, got the the fight slipped right into the submission, and he got the victory. He got he got lucky where it just went right to where he wanted to go. But he's going up against a guy in El Basi. He, he trains at Lennon Shoot Fighters. He has great grappling, high-level uh, uh, BJJ background. He has good takedown and striking defense. I could see him looking to take the fight to the ground, not be afraid of the grappling and of Figurator, and it, just trying to wear on him, wear his cardio out, throw some strikes, uh, ground and pound, transition to side guard, just hold him there, make him use a lot of that energy to try and get out or transition to a better position, and then just just rack up the the points, and then uh, I could see him winning by decision. I don't I don't see him trying to submit him because I feel like he knows better than to try and play that chess game with a guy who is a high level BJJ artist. So I, I could see him just lay and pray and then throw strikes to keep the threat honest. But then on the feet, I feel like his striking is good enough to where he can use it to set up those uh, takedown attempts and he has the better cardio. So I'm going with the beer Abazi by decision as well. Yeah, you know, uh, Francisco doesn't have a lot of submission losses on his record. No. Um, but he does leave his neck out there, yeah. uh, which is something to, to keep a lookout for. Yeah, hey, definitely. Um, be before you area to attack it, but I feel like he's not going to touch it. I feel like he's going to play it safe a little bit and just get out with the decision victory. Yeah, that you know, that was kind of my thinking too. But I can't have like eighteen decisions on a thirteen card fight. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I I think I have like a lot of decisions going, but I couldn't yeah. have every single fight be a decision. Yep. But let's move on to the fourth fight on the prelims. We got a men's welterweight matchup uh, between AJ Fletcher going up against Anj Lusa. We got the Ghost going up against the Last Ninja. Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? You know, this was a tough one, uh, but I'm going to go with Ange Lusa. Fletcher leaned, in, in my mind, Fletcher leaned on his wrestling way too much his last fight against Matt Summersberger and didn't do enough to get the win. Uh, he looked desperate at times in that fight. Um, he's young in his career. We get it. Ange Lusa is kind of young in his career, too, uh, but he's a higher strike, uh, higher volume striker, and he's coming in with a seven inch reach advantage. And I you know, I know a lot of people can say, oh, well, you can keep range, keep range. But you got somebody who moves forward, who has knockout power, and is giving up 
or and he's coming in with a seven inch reach advantage against a traditional wrestler it kind of may pose a threat there and i know that fletcher's got some good uh stand up as well but i think angelusa is going to win this one um and this is one of those ones that i was kind of alluding to earlier where it could be predicated on the amount of takedowns if yeah. fletcher gets a ton of takedowns but does nothing with it the takedowns could outweigh you know significant shots for these judges and it could go fletcher's way so i actually see this being a split decision win for angelusa yeah first first we got angelusa he has a kickbox and bjj background he likes to use his reach to attack with volume and combinations and he tends to always go to decision in his fights. He, ha- he doesn't have that many knockouts or subs. A lot of it's by decision where he just used the range to uh, yeah. win by volume. But then you got Fl- A.J. Fletcher. He has a boxing background, wrestling background, and BJJ background. He grew up doing boxing and wrestling. He looks to use quick combinations to set up those takedowns where he loves to transition into the subs. He has a lot of sub victories lately. He has really good cardio, but the one weakness uh, that he does have that I see that was a problem in the last fight against Semmersberger is his take uh, is his get ups from getting yep. taken down. He was able to take down and dominate round one, but then he made a mistake round two, and Semmersberger uh, got on top of him, and he couldn't get up. He was basically there on on the ground for the majority of the second round, and then there was half and half third round, and he couldn't went either way but the judges went to Semmersberger's way. But I feel like that won't be too much of a play in this matchup because Lusa is more of a, uh, a kickboxing style yeah. where Semmersberger is a striker, and then he did have a little bit of uh, a grappling background to him, whereas I think Lusa is going to be all about movement, all about mo- hit, move, hit, move, whereas Fletcher, he he's able to just close the distance so fast, and he has knockout power, uh, he tends to stun opponent, and then he jumps on top of them and puts a guillotine or a rear naked choke on. He's so quick to get on top of them. I feel like he wants to get that loss out of his uh, out of his mind because he should have won that fight against Semmersberger. He was dominating that fight, and he made one mistake, and then Semmersberger capitalized on it several times. I'm going with Fletcher by round two sub here. I think he gets the the rear naked choke on him. I think he's, his striking's better. I think his uh, grappling's better and his cardio is better. He, he just needs to watch out for the hit and move, hit and move because he's not going to put, I don't think he's going to put out more volume, but I think he's going to do more damage. And I think he's going to get him out in the second with the rear naked choke sub. Yeah, this is one of those fights that honestly, in my opinion, could go either way. Um, Lusa, like to your point, has knockout power, but hasn't knocked anybody out in six years. Yeah. And Fletcher has a pretty good chin. So uh, that that was the one that I kind of circled where I'm like, this might be one of the most interesting yeah. matchups on this card for me. Yeah. Well, let's move over to the fifth fight on the prelims. We got a women's flyweight matchup between Miranda uh, Maverick, uh, nicknamed Fierla, and then we got Shauna the Shanimal Young. And Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? Well, I'm going to go with former guest of the show, Miranda Maverick, winning this one. Um, Young looked really good against Gina Mazzani, her last fight out. But Miranda Maverick has been elevating her game. She's really gone back to the um, to the yeah. basics, uh, really going back to like what she's strong at and incorporating her boxing. She's really great at that. Um, these two fought before um, in Invicta, with Maverick winning, and I see it going the same way. So I'm going to go uh, Miranda Maverick, uh, first round sub. Yeah, Shauna Young, she looked good the last fight. She has the black belt in karate and Brazilian jiu jitsu. She likes to fight the distance game. We see a lot of, the, of those fighters with the with karate, kickboxing. They want to use that range to dictate the pace. So she wants to move around. She throws a lot of different style leg kicks and, and she attacks with them, but she's going to move in and out of range so she can yeah, throw a, uh, throw a strike but then not get hit. The one thing with her that is going to play a big part in this is her takedown defense. She doesn't have great takedown defense. I thought Gina Mazzani was able to get to her early, and it was just a couple shots in that later on 
where Shana Young took advantage of Gina kind of getting tired where she was able to finish her. Miranda Maverick has good cardio. She has great uh, grappling. She has great uh, striking. I feel like I feel like that move from Virginia to Team Elevation has played a big part in her making those uh, necessary corrections because she's, because she's not relying just on the wrestling. She's not or or the striking. She's now utilizing them both at the same time. She's setting yep. up her uh, her takedowns with her striking. She's just using takedowns to fake her opponents out to then get her striking going. She hits hard. Uh, she is always uh, moving forward. And I feel like she gets it done uh, round one submission here. I think she gets it in and out, and she's the superior fighter. So I got her winning this one by round one uh, guillotine. Yeah, um, I, w- I was going to go over your naked choke on this one. Just that you – I mean, you highlighted it perfectly. That move to team elevation really – um, made her more of a well-rounded fighter. Yeah. It was it was a good move. Some people, you know, will find moves and like be like, oh, you know, I needed something different and it doesn't work out. But like Miranda Maverick making the move, uh, Brandon Moreno go into uh, glory proved to be a great move for him as well. So you know, sometimes you know you have to embrace the change. Yeah, that, that, that's what a lot of fighters do. They they move, they move, even even. Undefeated, you had Kamar Usman who moved. He went to uh, he went to Colorado as well. He yeah. changed camps. Amanda Nunez changed camps. She made her own camp. It's just, it's yep. just like when you know it's time to move on, you move on, and then yeah. you start start fresh somewhere else because you know you don't want to get complacent and then to have your career go downhill because you're not making those necessary corrections or new additions to your game yeah i mean look at camaro where i know we're going to talk about him later but yeah. once he hooked up with trevor whitman like he became such a like a dynamic more dynamic fighter than he already was like yeah a lot of people were like he's going to be a boring champion because all he does is push you to the fence and then stomps your feet and then he's starching masvidal and then he's starching gilbert yeah. burns and colby you know he became such a more complete fighter. It, it was a and, great and I'm, move. I'm going to get more into that in the main event, but uh, yeah. let's transition to the sixth fight. On the prelim, we got a men's featherweight matchup between Sean Woodson going up against Luis Saldana. We got the sniper, once again, the nickname going up against Saldana. Uh, Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? I feel like there needs to be a rule for nicknames. Like if you're in the yeah. same promotion and you have the same nickname, you have to fight for the name, regardless of weight class. But um, I really like Sean Woodson. And what a debut that man had knocking out Terrence McKinney in, in the contender series. I mean, yeah. and think about where McKinney is right now. But I'm going to go with Sean Woodson in this one. High volume striker, six inch reach advantage. It only plays into his favor. Um, Saldana has showed more versatility in his last fight going for two takedowns, uh, which yeah. has been something that has cost Woodson in fights before. When he loses yeah. the, the battle on the ground, he loses the fight. But I see Woodson keeping it standing, working from the distance. Uh, Sadania has a really good chin, so I'm going to go with Woodson by decision. No surprise there. And maybe this sets up a grudge match between him and Terrence McKinney. McKinney's looking for a, an opponent. I know he called Patty out. But that's a dangerous fight for Patty. Maybe, you know, get that loss avenged uh, and go against Sean Woodson. Yeah, I don't see that happen just because McKinney is ahead of him in the rankings. I think it's a, a big difference because Woodson has been a, as active as McKinney has. True. But but within this matchup, you got Woodson, who he's a freestyle fighter with a background in boxing and grappling. He comes in, he has this huge height and reach advantage in his matchup, and I think it's going to play a, a big difference in, in the decision. He's a guy that likes to float between featherweight and lightweight, which I like. So he likes to go back and forth, back and forth. Whereas Luis Zaldana, he's primarily a striker. He has that boxing background. He has He's been improving that BJJ background. I believe he's a blue belt as of right now in, in jiu-jitsu. He trains at fight ready. He has quick hands and good combinations, but he has weak takedown 
uh, he's weak against takedowns and he needs to prove his uh, defense. He tends to get hit a lot, but he uses that to uh, throw his own strikes back. It's like he, he's taken one that throw two, and he's always constantly moving forward. Uh, he got that win last fight because of that, because he was taking shots, but then he was pouring out more volume than his opponent did, and he was able to pick up the decision victory here. I got Sean Woodson, though. I think that big reach advantage is going to play a, a big factor. I think he's going to land good shots. He's going to grapple uh, so down al- along the cage, throw those elbows, throw those knees. I could see him get out, out, out of this fight with a second or third round knockout. Because I, I just think that that big reach, it's not even just a big, it's a huge reach. Yeah. And when that happens, unless Sedona can get inside and get his uh, distance game going, Woodson's going to have an easy uh, job throwing those big power strikes and then laying big shots on him and then knocking him out. Yeah, I mean, he's 6'2 in this division. Like, that's huge yeah. for, for featherweight. I'd like to see Woodson be more active. Uh, he's got enough tools yeah. to get himself to where McKinney is. Um, you know, McKinney kind of paved the way and said, like, you, you, I'm a young fighter. I'm taking fights on short notice against Drew Dober. Yeah. Um, I'm going to capitalize on my momentum. I'd like to see Woodson do the exact same thing. Yeah, he, def- he definitely does because he does have that experience and he does have that potential. Yeah, yeah, so I, I dynamic. That, yeah. It's just I, I feel there's this some something a little missing because like when, when I look at the guys that he's fought so far uh, in the UFC going down here uh, as soon as it loads because you know how how uh, it tends to load uh, like he's had some interesting uh, fights moving up and he he, he had that one uh, against uh, Terrence McKinney and then he, since then if you see there. He's beaten uh, Kyle Bachney out by decision. He lost by choke to Rosa. Rosa is a guy who has a similar, if not a little bit bigger reach, and yeah. he was able to choke him out. And then he's beaten Zalaw by decision and Colin Anglin by hooks to head. So it's like I think he needs to get that step up in competition uh, to uh, be able to challenge himself. He, I feel like he's staying in that same realm of fighters. Yeah. And, and just winning or not challenging himself. And I think that's something that's going to hurt him in the end. Yeah, you know, a lot of it kind of hinges on the contracts too, right? We saw O'Malley yeah. do the exact same thing where he only took fights that he thought, he, you know, take fights that are easy fights. And then once Patty you fight out of that, yeah, pa- exactly. Yeah. And you earn your contract. Like, why take a why take a fight against Terrence McKinney, who, which is a very dangerous fight for fifteen grand? When you, later down the line, when you're ranked and McKinney's ranked in the top ten, you could take that fight and win two, and, you know two hundred thousand, one hundred seventy five thousand. You know it's yeah. it's a business. You got to make business moves, and maybe that's what yep. Woodson's playing. Yep. Well, let's move on to the next light, fight on the prelims. We got a, a nice women's fan weight matchup between Lucy. Pudalova going up against uh, Yan and Wu. We got uh, Lucy versus Mulan. Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? Yeah, man, this is another one that could go either way, in my opinion. Um, but I have Lucy Pudalova winning this one. Um, neither have had success in the UFC. This is Lucy's second time in the UFC. I believe yeah. she has like one win. Um, but Pudalova seems to have fixed some holes in her game. Comes in riding a uh, a two fight win streak and other promotions um, and te- has the momentum under her belt. Whereas Wu hasn't won in four years. And if she loses this fight, um, she could be out of the UFC. The fight depends on which Pudalova shows up for me. Um, if it's the aggressive one, she's going to get the unanimous decision. If it's the timid mm-hmm. version of Lucy uh, Pudalova, she's going to get the split decision. So either way, I have uh, Lucy Pudalova winning by decision. Yeah, well, we've seen that Yanimu is riding a three-fight losing streak. She did look better in the last fight. I believe she was fighting Myra Buena Silva, I believe it yeah. was. but And she picked that fight up later in the second or third round, but she did lose. 
but uh, she she trains BJJ and Sonda. She has good hands, good cardio. I think the move to Jackson Wink is paying dividends for her the past uh, fight or so. Uh, that she's been able to improve the BJJ and grappling side of things. That's always been a a weakness of her, and I think uh, the more that she trains there, the better she's going to get. And I think that's why she keeps on getting these chances because she made the the move there. Uh, but then you got Pudalova. She has that Muay Thai background. She throws quick strikes, has quick movement. She fights from the orthodox style, likes to use the reach, of course, as any Muay Thai fighter does. Her leg kicks are really good. I love the, the fact that she throws the front kick a lot to create space. She'll yeah. attack the head with that spin kick every now and then. She connect that in the Irene Aldana fight. Even though she lost it, she hit uh, Aldana really well in the head in that fight and hurt Donna, who is a top five fighter. And she likes to attack all three levels of the body with those leg kicks. Like, so she's going to be primarily using her leg kicks and then mixing in some of the other uh, jabs and overhand shots uh, in between them. And that's why I got Lucy put a little over win this by decision. I, 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 th- I think she would have a chance to knock her out with one of those leg kicks but I think she's just going to move around, be aggressive with the leg kicks, attack her all three levels with the leg kicks, keep on moving, avoid getting up close because that's where Yan and Wu will have a chance with those uh, judo throws to get her to the ground and then to limit all the striking from her because she's she's going to want to stand up. And I feel like Wu's going to want to get the fight to the ground, use those transitions and use the ground and pound. I think she, the movement's going to favor her. I, I'm not sure how her cardio is going to match up against Yan and Wu, but I feel like the volume game, she's going to be well ahead of Wu, and that's why I got her winning by decision, as long as she can avoid those takedowns. Yeah, I agree 100% with you, man. Um, both of these fighters are really in a, a t- tough position with Lucy coming back to the UFC and this yeah. being her second shot, and Yan and with, you know, this is her, could be her fourth loss in a row. So, there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot riding on this one for both. Uh, both women. Yep. But let's move on to the prelim uh, uh, matchup of the prelims. Uh, we got Jared Gordon going up against Leonardo Santos in the lightweight division. We got the Flash going up against Santos. Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? Yeah, this is a good uh, main event for the prelims. Um, I have. Jared Gordon winning this fight. Um, other than his fight with Grant Dawson, where he was taken down seven times, uh, yeah. Gordon has done a really good job mixing in takedowns with his striking. Um, Santos has been a lower volume striker and has been less active, still has knockout power. Um, and he's coming in with nine months off. And at 42 years old, that could be a big issue. You know, you can't, fa- you know, father tam- time is the biggest opponent to these fighters. Um, we we kind of saw that in in Dom Cruz a little bit, yeah. even though that was, you know, potentially fight of the year. Uh, that yeah. was a fantastic matchup. Um, and I'm so bummed that we didn't get to talk about that and do a show, but it is what it is. Um, but the, the whole 42, nine months off, that's going to be a big issue for Santos, in my opinion. Uh, so I have um, Gordon winning by decision. Yeah, Gordon has that very nice uh, background because he has boxing – he has wrestling and he has BJJ, but re- like you would think that wrestling was the primary thing, but he likes the the boxing aspect of this game the most. And he likes to use that to set up the the grapple. And he has a weak chin. We've seen it uh, in past fights. That's the one weakness. But he's good at throwing strikes and kicks from a distance, and then mixing in those takedowns to overpower his opponents onto the mat. You've seen him get several takedowns a fight when he needs to it's it's a way of making his opponent think and then to take him away from the striking aspect of his game so he's not shown as being one-dimensional then you got leonardo santos he's a fourth degree black belt he has knockout power and he has great grappling uh, uh, chances that he uses uh, because of the knockout power the one thing that i do not like about him is he starts fast and then he starts to fade dramatically after right. the fourth and fifth minute mark. Uh, I saw an interview with uh, 
uh, with uh, Jared Gordon, where he mentions that he, he he watches a lot of Santos tape, and Santos starts out fast the first three minutes. He's very good. He lands a lot, but then after three four minutes, he starts to dwindle in cardio and he starts to slow down. So I, I could see a scenario where Santos pours it on early. And if he doesn't get that quick finish in those three minutes, because just like I said, the chin of Jared Gordon is his weakness, then I could see Jared Gordon winning by late sub or uh, by decision here. It all depends on how that first three minutes go and if he can protect himself uh, until Santu starts to wear down and to go down in cardio. But I, I got Jared Gordon winning this one by decision. Yeah, you know, you made a great point, and I saw the same interview as you did. Um, that made me think that the game plan is going to be different for Jared coming into this one, and he's going to shoot for a takedown out the gate yeah. and wear uh, Leonardo down quicker uh, to piece him up and get that decision win. I wouldn't be surprised if he did that because it would be a nice way to try and make that uh, gas tank go down even more because he's going to have to work – to fight off the takedown, and then if he gets taken down, he's going to have to try and get up. But yeah. then it could be a thing that maybe helps out uh, him as well because then he's letting Jared Gordon use energy, and he's not throwing all those big, uh, heavy strikes. So he's where he's using energy, but not as much. So yeah, uh, but I I could see that happening in in the benefit of Jared Gordon. I agree. Let's move on to the main card for UFC 278. The first fight that we have is a light heavyweight uh, is a nice light heavyweight matchup between Tyson Pedro going up against Harry Hunsucker. And we got uh, Pedro going up against the Hurricane. I believe this is Harry Hunsucker making the move down from heavyweight yeah. to light heavyweight, which could be beneficial for him. Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? Uh, the first thing that stuck out to me was that move, uh, heavyweight to light heavyweight. Um, yeah. I believe his last fight, he came in at like 238. So he's dropping, you know, that weight cut's going to be pretty significant. Um, this one's interesting, man. Um, all, of his, all of Harry Hunsucker's professional losses have been via knockout. Yes. And, pa and Tyson Pedro looked really good mixing in his leg kicks and dist uh, dist uh, distributing his shots last fight. Pedro's a low-volume striker, but he's active, and Hunsucker is hittable, very hittable. He moves forward. You know, he stands on that line. That's your that's your go-to. He stands right on the straight line. Yeah. Um, not to mention, Hunsucker fought Tyson Pedro's training partner, Tai Tuivasa, recently. So there's a lot of fami uh, familiarity in Pedro's camp. So there's yeah, yeah, I think he fought him. He fought Justin Tapa. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, he's I think he got similar style the, fighters. And I think he got uh, put to sleep by both of them. Yeah. Um, so I think that's going to happen again. I'm going to go Tyson Pedro, second round KO. Yeah. I want to see how he looks condition wise, making a cut in those 30 pounds to a light heavyweight. See how he looks. See if he has any quickness to him. See if he, if that just being that heavy just was a hindrance to his uh, career. But you were right with Tyson Pedro. Like, he is low volume. He does throw those nice leg kicks in the striking. But there's a reason why he does it. It's because of his grappling. He, he yeah. has a lot of submission victories in his career because he likes to uh, mix in the striking. And then when he stuns or makes his opponent think too much, he gets in close. He takes him down. And then he uh, submits him. It's that nice wrinkle to his game. We just don't remember it because of – his last fight being his first fight back in three years because of injuries. Yeah. He missed yeah. a lot of time due to injury, but he has that dual uh, threat with his uh, striking and the grappling that people just don't remember because of it. And I think it could play a big factor in this one, but we might not even see that because of just like you said, uh, Harry Hunsucker has a glass chin. When he, when he gets hit, it just seems like he just goes out. He has, two or three straight uh, knockout losses. He had knockout, knockout. He did get the win, but then he got ground and pounded by Jared Varandera right. on the Contender Series. So that's three straight finishes, uh, three finishes and four fights against him. 
in the in the UFC. So I'm gonna go with the Tyson Pedro by first round knockout here. I was thinking between that and submission because maybe he wants to make a point and try and submit him. But I think it's going to be easy for him to use those leg kicks yeah, to uh, wear out those legs. And then he's going to hit him with the shot because he's going to use the leg kicks to set up the, the overhand shot. So I got Pedro by first round knockout. Yeah, this is uh, I've been a fan of Tyson Pedro's um, since Mark yeah. Hunt was talking about him towards the end of Mark Hunt's career. Um, yeah. It's crazy that the last two knockouts for Harry Hunsucker were against Tafa and Tuivasa. And he's just walking into, you know, these buzz saws. Yeah. And he's going up against Pedro. So there's so much familiarity in that camp and so much tape on it that they're like, all right, well, this is what he does. This is what you do. Game over. Yeah. Definitely so. Well, let's transition to the next fight on the main card. We got a men's uh, heavyweight matchup between Marcin Tabora going up against Alexander Romanov. We got Tiber going up against King Kong. Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? This is a good fight. Um, besides Tybora's last fight with uh, Volkov, both of these fighters have looked great. Romanov has looked more consistent and has the power and grappling advantage in my decision, in my opinion. Um, Tybora has really upped his game, but I think he's going to be um, outmanned by Romanov. He's going to be too. Romanov is going to be too strong too fast um and he's gonna get this fight to the ground and spend a lot of time on the ground but i see him getting a decision win so romanov by decision yeah I, i've liked up until the the fight with uh and volkov i've liked what i've seen from tabor lately because he likes to mix the grapple and and the striking he, he likes to uh, attack the body a lot he likes to throw a uh, mix between the body and the head to try and make you think. And then when you're too busy doing that, that's when he uses the grappling along the cage and then to the ground to, to his advantage. But you got a guy with a high level of grappling background in Romanov who has that, uh, it seems like he has that Sambo background. He forces you backwards, takes you down. Really, like we really haven't had to see a lot of the striking from Romanov because all he really does with the striking is those overhand shots to try and yep. knock you out. And when you're moving backwards, he just goes and takes you down. And he seems to have ease doing so with the victories that he has. Uh, you saw against a guy like Jared Bandera where he was able to take him down pretty easily and then submit him. And that's his game plan. He takes you down and then he submits you. But then he has a couple of ground and pounds mixed in as well. I see Alexander Romanov taking him down uh, and submitting him. But I think it goes into the second round. I think it takes him to the second round just because Tabor has a, a high level uh, 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 like experience. He'll yeah. be able to fight him off for at least one round. He might even get some good shots in on Romanoff, but at some point Romanoff is going to take him down and then submit him. So I'm going with Romanoff by second round sub. Yeah, this is a big matchup for Romanoff. And um, with this win, it's a big tra- uh, boost in the trajectory of his career. Yeah, I, I can only just imagine – who they're going to be able to put up uh, with him against afterwards? Like I'm, I'm just thinking after Polar that bear. loss they just uh, well after the loss they just had. If, if I see Romanoff win, I want to see Romanoff against Derek Lewis uh, Ooh, because okay. they're right because they're right there in the rankings because of Derek Lewis losing uh, to Sergey Pavlovich, and and you, you know at this point they're going to have, feed. Uh, Derek Lewis to somebody instead of giving somebody to Derek Lewis because of the yeah. uh, three straight losses that he has. I'd like to see Romanov go up against uh, Spivak, and I'd like to see Derek Lewis go up against Walt Harris. Yeah, <laughs> I would, but you know, you know, they, you know, they're going to want to put a striker against Romanov at this point For to sure. test him because if you look at it, he really hasn't fought any good strikers. He's mm-hmm. fought guys with decent striking, but then more grappling in their background. So I'm going to see him going up against a big time striker that can challenge him uh, in the stand up game and then make him have to make corrections to his game. Would you consider Chris Dawkins one of those big time strikers, maybe a potential I, matchup I, for him? I, I don't know because he's coming. I could see that happening, but then he's coming off of two straight uh, losses and he yeah. hasn't looked good. So. And uh, that Derek, even though Derek Lewis has lost three, 
it, it, it gives them that main event, uh, 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 like uh, chances for like a fight night where they can put Lewis and Romanoff in like a main event. Right. Yeah, that would be a great main event. Yeah. I'd like that. But let's move on to the next fight on the main card. We got a men's uh, bantamweight matchup between Jose Aldo growing up against Marav uh, De Valise Fili. Uh, we got a junior going up against the machine. Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? This was the hardest one for me to pick. And I know there's people listening and they're like, what are you talking about? Um, yeah. Jose Aldo looked like vintage Jose Aldo lately, whereas Marab Davalashvili has been on a tear since losing to Ricky Simone in Atlantic City the last time the UFC was near us. Yes. Um, the deciding factors to me is whether Marab will be able to take Jose Aldo down and, or whether Jose Aldo is going to be able to hit Marab um, as much as his previous opponents because of Marab's, like, fight style. He moves around a lot, high energy, high cardio. Um, he doesn't like to get touched a lot. Uh, this is a pick em fight for me. Um, and I believe yeah, you just scrolled down. Yeah. The the odds are near even. Um, but I'm, I think Marab stays out of reach enough, gets one or two takedowns and wins this by decision. But, and this is a big but, um, I could also see Jose stopping him after chopping his legs down. You made a good point with Barab where he likes to use the the wrestle and he likes to take down his opponents a couple of times, and he's been mixing in those uh, his striking into that. He's been a, him becoming a more complete fighter, but I just look at that Martin Moraes fight where he was this close to being knocked out. Moraes had him had him dead to rights, and then Marab came back and was able to win that fight. Yeah. Uh, uh, b- barely win that fight, but he was this close getting uh, finished against a guy in Moraes who is now not even in the UFC anymore because he's been knocked out several times uh, before that and after that. And we've kind of seen like a renaissance from Jose Aldo. If you remember his style in the me- in the beginning, at uh, I believe it was featherweight, he was a leg kicker, a vicious yep. leg kicker. He was basically Lee, uh, Barbosa, Edson Barbosa before Edson Barbosa even showed up. He was that guy that was throwing those lethal leg kicks, just threw a lot of them, mixed in the striking. But it was those leg kicks movement and grappling that just killed people. And then he fought McGregor, and he went on that kind of that, that struggle in between and in the routine between divisions. Yep. But then he came to Bantamweight. He came to Bantamweight, and then he switched his game plan up. The one thing you need to do is when things aren't working, you switch things up. Now he's all about the movement. He's all about his boxing. His yeah. boxing has been so crisp. And then he uses those leg kicks when he needs to. Like He, he might throw five leg kicks in a fight, but then in the next one he'll throw 20. You don't know. That's the part of his game that he likes to disguise is how many leg kicks he's going to throw, and it throws his opponents off because he's because his boxing is doing so well with that jab. That jab is in. beautiful. He has a good upper, uh, upper cut hook. He has good overhand shots, but he's so quick. He's, uh, his, he has great, good cardio still, and he's just able to rack up the volume. Like no, Just look at the past match- matchups he's had. He looked good against Vera. He looked very good against Pedro Munoz. And then he went and showcased it all uh, against Rob Font. So it's not like, like, and then we've seen how Cheeto Vera is doing now. He, yeah. He's he's on like a four fight win streak since losing to Jose Aldo. And it was the volume game that beat Cheeto Vera in that matchup because that was a very good back and forth matchup. And, I feel like that's why I'm leaning towards Jose Aldo by decision here because I feel like he does have very good takedown defense. And if Moram doesn't take him down, it's going to be hard for Moram to win because he's not going to out-volume and outstrike Aldo. And Aldo's just going to be too quick for him. So it's going to come down to if Moram can take him down or not. And I don't think he will. And I'm going to go with Jose Aldo to win this one. I'm not mad at you. Um, like this is a, this was a tough one, hardest one for yeah. me, man. Um, Marab's a special fighter. This is this might just be a very small 
bump in the road for him, kind of like Cheeto, uh, where Cheeto lost to Jose and yeah. went on to do big things. This might be the same case for Marab, but I'm still going to ride with Marab. I think he uh, stuns the world. I, I'd be I, I'd be interested to see that happen because if he does, then that gets him into that top three essentially. And then at some point, you got to think maybe even though him and Sterling are training partners and good buds, that at some point they're going to have to face each other if if he's still champion. Yeah, if he wins, if he beats Dillashaw, yeah, for yeah, sure. yeah. Let's move on to the co-main event in the evening. We got a men's. A matchup at, at middleweight between Paulo Costa, the eraser, going up against the returning Luke Rockhold. Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? Honestly, I kind of wish the Marab and Josie Aldo fight was actually the co-main event. Yeah. Um, five years ago, this fight would have been amazing. Uh, but Luke Rockhold isn't the same Luke Rockhold as he was back then. His chin is gone. And he's been out for three years. I know he's going up against high volume strikers. And, you know, a lot of those knockouts were at 205 and he's dropping down to 185. But Costa's still a machine. Um, but the weight issue is always a concern. It's weird that, like, when you look at the, the rankings on topology, they focus on Costa being light heavyweight. Yeah. So, like, a part of me thinks that this is going to be a fight at 205 uh, if Costa doesn't make the weight. But I can't see how Costa loses this fight. Yeah. Um, this is a huge fight for him, and if he loses this fight, he could be out of the UFC. Luke Rockhold is a great mixed martial artist. He always has been, but he's been gone for years, like I said. Um, he's got the five-inch reach advantage. He's very hittable in, in, in terms of you know his chin, obviously, but Costa's yeah. very hittable as well. And Costa has enough power to stop Rockhold. So I'm going to go Costa getting this fight done early. First round knockout. Yeah. If you look, if you look at a Rockhold, he's plus 225. He hasn't fought in three years. The last time right. was Yanni Hovich. He, then he lost to Yo Romero, both uh, by knockouts. He beat David Branch. He lost to Michael Bisbin six years ago. And yeah. He beat Chris Ryman six years ago. So that's a long gap. And then Costa has lost two, but he's lost to Vittori and Adesana uh, in the past uh, year and a half. So he, that that experience of being active is going to play a big deal. And I do get your your opinions about Paulo Costa and his weight, but according to a lot of people, he looks very cut and he looks very in good shape right now. And it's not going to be a big difference in this matchup. But I think what is going to be the big deal is the glass chin of Luke Rockhold. And we right. know it hasn't been the same uh, since he's uh, left. And one hit to the face, and he's going to be knocked out. So once your chin goes, it goes. It doesn't come back. And he's going to play a lot of the distance game here. He's going to throw a lot of leg kicks to the shin and to the body. Move, hit, move, hit, move. That's going to be his uh, game plan. But then you got Costa. He's a power guy. He likes to get inside. He likes to throw those power shots. He likes to grapple with you. He can do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I just see him getting inside there, hitting Luke Rockhold with that overhand shot and putting his lights out. I'm with you on that one. I got a round one knockout by uh, Paulo Costa, and he's going to erase Luke Rockhold. Oh, nice. I'm clapping over here in the Studio B. Um, to your point about the weight cut, um, Costa's been talking to Patty Pimblett a lot about cutting weight because that's been, you know, Patty walks yeah. around, uh, he's a heavy lad. Um, and Whether, you know, the Twitter exchanges are, are serious, Costa's been reaching out to him about, you know, taking that approach. So maybe he comes and shred it yeah. and uh, earns, earns, his, uh, earns a better favor in the UFC, because I know the relationship between him and the UFC isn't very good right now. So this could be a, a big one for him. Yep. But let's move on to the main event of the evening. we got the UFC welterweight championship matchup. It's the rematch between Kamaru Usman going up against Leon Edwards. we got the Nigerian Nightmare going up against Rocky. Jim, what's your thoughts on this main event? And then who do you have winning? So there's no surprise to anyone that this is my fight of the night. 
Um, Usman has been the complete package as of late and has walked through the entire division. He knows Edwards well from their last time um, fighting years ago and watching him walk through walk his way through the division. Um, yeah. It would benefit Usman to go back to wrestling in this fight. And the reason why I say that is Edwards has improved his takedown defense. He's got great cardio. But I believe Usman's strength and wrestling technique is enough to wear him down a bit to, you know, work the stand-up. If Kamaru gets comfortable with his stand-up, he needs to work from a distance and avoid the clinch. Edwards does his best work from the clinch. Those nasty elbows, those forearms, you know, those small little, like, rabbit punches. He yeah. can land some significant shots in the clinch. He's a lengthy fighter. He fights long. Um, he's got all the tools to win this fight. And I'm talking about Edwards. But yeah. I don't see him beating Usman at this stage in his career. If anybody else were the champion at this division, uh, Leon Edwards would be the champ. But I see Kamaru Usman winning by decision. Yeah, both these guys, when they fought the first time, were totally had different fighters. You had right. Usman, who was a wrestler that was mixing in the striking, and he was able to take down Edwards and win uh, that fight by decision just because of the multiple takedowns he was able to get. Then you had Leon Edwards, who was a boxer coming in. The, he has the good, very good uh, striking and combinations. He attacks the body, attacks the head. But he's mixed in a lot since then as well. He's mixed in leg kicks. He's mixed in the grappling, the BJJ. He's become more of a complete fighter, just like Kamaru Usman. And that's why both these guys are riding 10-plus win streaks here. And they're on this collision course again because of how well they've both improved. I do know that Leon Edwards had that two-year gap because of the pandemic where he didn't fight, but then he came back, and he's looked good since. He had that iffy fight where he won, but it didn't look spectacular, but then he beat Nate Diaz as well, yeah. and he set himself uh, up for this uh, rematch and, and for the title. And I feel like he's going to challenge Usman with the – speed, the striking, the shots to the body. He's going to keep on moving, keep on moving. But it's just hard to go get up against Usman right. when at any point he could go back to the wrestling. And we got to see how well Leon Edwards does defending it. Because if he can't de defend those takedowns, he, it's just going to happen the same way as it did before, but this time five rounds. But the fight goes standing. This is the one guy that could outstrike Usman. It yeah. is Edwards. He could outstrike him with those shots because he has the speed. He has the movement. Covington had the, the volume. He just didn't have the, the power. And that Edwards has that power, and he has the, the speed. And we, I got to see also how well Edwards does moving forward because he's only fought five rounds once. And I yeah. got to see how it does fighting five rounds again, whereas Usman – has fought five rounds for the past, I feel like, 10 bites. <laughs> so with, with all that, I'm leaning towards Kamaru Usman by decision. Like, I do think Edwards has a really a good shot at winning this fight. But until I see Usman lose, I'm going with Usman by decision. Yeah, this kind of reminds me of, like, the Pena-Nunez one fight where, like, yeah. you could get, like, the shocking win. I will say that um, Usman's path to the title and title defense um his strength of schedule has been better than edwards um yes. edwards was able to duck woodley he was able to duck um masvidal covington even muhammad you know that was a an eye poke when he fought luke a when luke a was doing well he fought nate diaz or nate diaz who you know isn't the same nate diaz from years ago um so i'm curious to see what this next step in competition is because now like being able to duck like Covington, like Leon could like Leon probably could have fought Covington. I, I, I do know who's next and he's going to win in a couple weeks and set it up. And that's uh, Shamayev. That's who's next. Oh no. I was talking about the, the next step up, but yeah, Shamayev is definitely next. See, there's, I, I, whoever wins there's no next, way. Shamayev is next. Uh, that, that's why, why I should have said, he is next, and I think that's a guy that I want to see fight 
Usman, but if Edwards wins, I I watch that too. But I just see Usman and Shemayev the end of the year, possibly January in Rio de Janeiro and Brazil. I could see that fight happening. Oh, see, I see that one being a fight island. Uh, that's a fight island fight right there. Um, whenever they go there, they match up well with the wrestling and the striking. Yeah. I don't, you know, we don't really know about uh, Shemayev's gas tank. Yeah. Um, and we are we may see that uh, against Nate Diaz um, if he doesn't destroy him in the first round because Diaz is a, you know, he's on his bike, man. He's got great cardio. So, um, but that's that's for another time. That's for a couple weeks from now. Uh, but yeah, Usman and still. Yep. But other than that, that'll wrap things up with uh, tonight's UFC 278 four card predictions with uh, me and Jim. We will be back in a couple weeks because we got a week off in between where we're going to cover UFC Fight Night Paris, where it's going to be headlined by Cyril Gan going up against Tai Torivasa in a top five heavyweight battle. I am looking forward to that matchup. And once it was announced, I, I saw a banger of a main event. It's going to yeah. I guarantee that that fight's not going to decision in that matchup. But other than that, of course, as always, this is Cage My IQ. Uh, follow and subscribe to us on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube. Make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. And then also smash the like button down below. Hit us up in the comment section uh, to, the, to the right if you haven't done so already. And then check out all the rest of the content that we have out. I just put out the the one on Amazon Prime one uh, prediction show out. I'm coming out with the, of course, PFL uh, nine prediction show later in the week. And then check out the rest of the stuff that is coming out on the channel. But other than that, I'm your host, Cage. This is my co-host, Jim. And we will see you guys next time on another edition of Cage My IQ. Thanks for tuning in.